Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to podcast number 120. This podcast is dedicated to the prehistoric life of Mexico. It's a very exciting episode, and I know you're going to enjoy it because I absolutely loved, loved being able to do it. In this episode, our feature creature is going to be Cohila Ceratops, which is a cool looking Ceratopsian. We're going to interview paleontologist Ruben Guzman Gutierrez, who will tell us about some of the prehistoric life that once lived in Mexico. I assure you that interview I enjoyed immensely. He's really going to give you some cool information. And then if time allows, I'll try to answer a couple of Ask DG questions. So sit back and relax and let's get into it. Well, we're just coming back off of a two-week traveling tour with our museum, and I enjoyed it immensely. We had such a great time. We visited schools up near Dallas and Dallas, Texas, and then we went and spent a week in a city called College Station, Texas, where we took the museum to to three different elementary schools. I also did a, uh, a series of assemblies for another school while we were there. We probably saw close to 10,000 people in that time. So it was great. It was very successful. We enjoyed it immensely. The students in all the schools that we went to were just the best. I've got the greatest job in the world. I'll be the first to stand up and say it. It is simply fantastic to be able to bring so much happiness and so much excitement and so much science into the lives of children of all ages uh, and every background you can imagine. So it was a great week, and I I really had a good time doing it. Uh, my voice is a little rough today because I'm dealing with allergies. You know, one of the bad things about traveling as much as I do is I'm always going into new places. And when you go to new places, you have to deal with new allergens. And, and you know, that's something to think about with animals that migrate, like talk about dinosaurs. As dinosaurs travel into new areas, there's always things there that could cause them problems. And all life deals with this. New predators, new species of plants that they may or may not be able to eat. Um, And so I kind of laugh because every time I go to a new part of the state or the country, I always end up with an allergy problem. And I think, I don't know what's here, but whatever it is, it's waiting an ambush for somebody like me to be unsuspecting and walk in and get ambushed. So hopefully my voice will last during this episode. So anyway, I, I hope it, uh, I hope my voice lasts. Raptors are the most deadly dinosaurs that ever lived. And now you can own their replica claws, feet, and skulls. Imagine your own Velociraptor skull or the foot of a giant Utah Raptor. Raptor hand claws and deadly killer claws are just some of the items you'll find in our web store. We accept all forms of payment and ship worldwide. Our pricing is affordable and we don't charge outrageous shipping or handling fees. Visit our website at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection today. It's time for our feature creature segment. If you would like to suggest a creature, go to dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com and post it in the comment section of this episode or email us your suggestions to contact at dinosaurgeorge.com. And now, our feature creature. Our feature creature for this episode is Quahila Ceratops. It is a member of the horned dinosaurs called Ceratopsians, and it belongs within the Chasmosaurian group within that family. They separate the uh, the Ceratopsians into two groups based on sort of the shape and design of their frill. So Quahila Ceratops fits into the group called the Chasmosaurians. Now, this dinosaur lived about uh, 72 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, and it was discovered in northern Mexico in the state of Cohila. So that's where it gets its name, Cohila being the name of the state and Ceratops meaning horn face. 
It's a quadrupedal herbivore, which means it walks on four legs and it eats plants. And its true body size isn't known because very few remains of this dinosaur have been found. So when few remains are found, what scientists are able to do are take what bones are found and compare it to other members of that family to try to figure out exactly how large it would be. So their estimates are that it was about six meters or around 22 feet long. Pretty big size, pretty good sized animals. But the most interesting feature of this dinosaur is the estimate of the size of the brow horns. Now, the brow horns are the big horns that go over the eyes. Um, no, they, they never found a complete horn. So paleontologists had to use a huge amount of time and effort to try to compare what they had found with similar dinosaurs to come up with a legitimate estimate of how big those horns were. And what they, what they discovered or what they hypothesized is that this dinosaur has the longest horns of any other member of the Ceratopsian family. And that includes the big boys like Triceratops and Taurosaurus. These horns may have reached four feet in length. What a massive, what a massive set of horns this animal had. So if you would like more information about Cohila Ceratops, its name is spelled C-O-A-H-U-I-L-A. C-E-R-A-T-O-P-S. Cohila ceratops. It's a magnificent dinosaur. And in fact, coming up in just a moment, our special guest, uh, Ruben Guzman Gutierrez, will be talking a little bit about this dinosaur, but also about some of the amazing life that once existed in what is now Mexico. So hang on for that. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling museum to your community today. Our guest on this episode is a friend of mine who I was lucky enough to meet through Facebook. He is the director of vertebrate paleontology at the Center for the Conservation of Natural and Cultural Heritage of Mexico. And some of his achievements, some, is that he's done research on the giant uh, fossilized crocodile Dinosuchus, which I love. He's done research on the armored dinosaurs like uh, Edmontonia. And then he got to do some research on fossil tracks of mammoth. And and that I'm excited about. He is a paleontologist, and he is Ruben Guzman Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I really appreciate your invitation, and I'm really honored to uh, be here with you. Well, thank you. I was so lucky. Like I said, I was lucky enough to meet you through Facebook. Now, I'm familiar with with some of the different papers that you're associated with. Anything that comes out of Mexico, I I like, because living in Texas, of course, what you had in Mexico, we probably had here. So I known of you, but I am so thrilled that uh, we've had the opportunity to get to talk to you. So before we we get into stuff, can you tell us a little bit just about yourself? Sure, Uh, sure, George. Uh, Well, I'm I'm Mexican. Uh, I studied biology first um, as a major at the university. Uh, and then, well, I, I made um, um, graduate studies on virtual paleontology in some universities here in Mexico and in the United States. Uh, I was very lucky to be uh, an intern for the Dynamation International Society many, many years ago in, in Colorado. And, uh, well, I I have uh, worked uh, here in Mexico for many years now on virtual paleontology, uh, um, mainly on dinosaurs and fossil mammals, as you have uh, said. Right. I I love Dynamation. I didn't realize you worked for that. What what was that like? Oh, it it was... uh, Wonderful experience. I worked under the direction of uh, Jim Kirkland. So it was a wonderful and a great experience for, for, my, uh, for, for, uh, 
for me. That's that's great. You know, Dynamations was really the first, I think the first group who really started creating some of the, uh, that was a robotic dinosaurs, right? The ones that, that moved and everything. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The, right. The animatronic dinosaurs right. that they produce in California. Right. But I was working on on the their other part that was in Colorado, uh, what is now part of the Museum of Western Colorado in Flora. Oh, wow. That's, oh, that's really neat. I went to that museum. I like it. It's a very, very nice museum. Yeah, it is. That's really neat. So, now, over the last several years, we keep hearing of new discoveries that are taking place uh, in Mexico. So, yeah. I, I would like to kind of break the interview into two groups. One, I'd love to talk about the dinosaurs and some of the Mesozoic animals. And then we can move into the Cenozoic, which I, I really like. So let's talk okay. about some of the some of the dinosaurs that lived in Mexico. And and maybe if you can tell us a little bit about the, the environment. Was was the majority of the country sort of underwater during the Cretaceous as well? Yes, that's right. Uh, most of Mexico, what is uh, today Mexico, was part uh, of the uh, Western Interior Seaway, which channeled uh, into uh, Laramidia and Appalachia, and uh, it it was uh, it broke in part uh, these two land masses, and Mexico was uh, at very uh, the continental uh, part of Mexico was very small at the end of the Cretaceous, so uh, the fossils that we find in Mexico are uh, uh, only are, are found only in in some of the northern states of the of this uh, country. Right. So so what is found uh, as far up as Canada is that right? You could find similar animals living in Mexico. Well, uh, similar, yes, uh, not the same genus or, or species, but. The fauna is uh, generally uh, overall the same from Canada through the Western United States and then into what is now Mexico. Right. Now, was there any evidence to suggest that the environment was dramatically different since you were, I guess, farther south during the Mesozoic? Did that matter? Do you see a great difference in in temperatures or or the environmental situation between uh, your part of that time and further north, things further north? Uh, Well, what we find, what what we have found here is uh, that the conditions, uh, the uh, environmental conditions here in in Mexico were uh, somewhat different because uh, there was uh, um, the... The very last part of the of the continent. So um, we found delta um, a, a delta uh, environment uh, with the uh, well. We have found, for example, uh, plants and insects that uh, are quite different uh, that you find, for example, in Texas or in. Uh, other parts of the United States. So I believe that uh, the conditions were different ah. in this part of North America right. at and, the Mesozoic times. And so could that have been, could that have done two things? One, could it have caused your dinosaurs to devol- evolve differently? And could that have acted as a barrier to maybe keep other animals from migrating down in that that could not adapt to that sort of environment. Yes, uh, that's right. Because uh, what is now the state of Coahuila, where we have found the majority of uh, dinosaur findings here in Mexico, uh, at that time was a peninsula. So uh, before the... Uh, Source of uh, of the mountain ranges of North America, it was a uh, uh, um, a very isolated 
uh, landmass, what is now Coahuila State. Right. So you've got, in Coahuila, you've got animals that have a separation, so they are evolving maybe a different path. So let's talk about Coahuila ceratops, which is, which is one that I really, yeah. that I really like. Can you kind of describe to the listeners what, what that dinosaur is? Sure. Uh, this uh, ceratopsian, uh, the uh, horned dinosaur named Coahuila ceratops, uh, has a different, uh, uh, has a very char- characteristic uh, horns, which were very thick and uh, uh, very long uh, and uh, as uh, uh, it uh, belonged to a group named the Cosmosaurine, uh, we have uh, found, for example, other Cosmosaurines in northern Chihuahua, uh, which are uh, similar to what uh, uh, what what they have found in uh, in Texas, but in the southern portion of Coahuila. Uh, the Casmosaurines evolved uh, very differently and gave birth to this uh, particular uh, genus named uh, uh, Coelaceratops. So he is a, a relative of, of the better known dinosaurs like Triceratops and Casmosaurus. He, he's a relative of those dinosaurs, but he is distinctively different. And that would be because earlier in its evolutionary trail, its ancestors, I guess, got cut off or somewhat separated from those of the North. So it kind of became its own animal. Is that a, is that a fair explanation? Yeah. Uh, for example, um, as a characteristic of uh, Coahuila ceratops, uh, its supraorbital horns are about a meter long. Uh, I believe that they are between the among the biggest uh, known for a ceratopsian. Wow. And the school is estimated to have been around mm, 1.8, 2 meters uh, long, for example. Wow. Now that's that's big. Now have you found more than, or has anyone found more than one specimen of this, the type specimen, or have you found multiple specimens? Well, uh, they have, not me, but uh, other uh, paleontologists have found more examples of this dinosaur. Uh, last month, uh, the, the discoverer of this uh, new genus and species, who is uh, the, the amateur paleontologist Claudio de Leon from, from Saltillo, Coahuila, he showed me some uh, some um, uh, horn core portions that also belong to this genus. So uh, maybe it was not very common, but yes, they have found more individuals belonging to this genus. So the point I was going to make was that because its horns were so large, could that be based on sexual dimorphism, maybe just the one that happened to be found had exceptionally large horns. But what it sounds like is they all share that trait. So that makes it a common trait for all of that species, right? Uh, yes. So what, what do you think Ruben is the function? I know there's so much debate whether the horns were actively used as defensive or were they, they were only used for show. Do what 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 is your opinion do or do you have an opinion of what you think they were for uh, well most of the paleontologists have uh, discussed this uh, and uh, they uh, mm, they do not agree with each other ah. but uh, i i believe that uh, they have to be more on uh, display that uh, with uh, uh, protection so, so you think that the um, that the horn played more of a role to perhaps show its maturity or even its sex, maybe to other members of the family. That was the main function of them, 
And then do you think it was a secondary function that they could be used for defense or do you think they're not designed? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that would be the second um, function, but the mainly the main uh, would be uh, the genus, uh, the recognition, recognition and uh, uh, sexual display. Wow. Now I know that it's unfair to ask a paleontologist to guess. Because you base you, your your comments are based on fact, but do you think that it's possible then that the horns and the frills may have been brightly colored, or do you think that might not be the best interest for the animal? In other words, could predators spot them so much easier? Do, do you think color would have played a role on these big frills and, and horns? Well, I would like to think that uh, uh, they will be uh, um, uh, that color would be um, mm, a, a present, a uh, bright colors present in in the uh, in the frill and horns. But um, that is my guess. Sure. Uh, I don't have uh, um, any uh, any other. Uh, thing on, on what uh, to base this i'm just assuming uh based on modern uh, birds and modern reptiles but uh i don't have uh, uh, any other fact right. which i can uh, take a hold of right now with with all the new advancements that are taking place like for instance uh i i did an interview with a paleontologist in in china who they were using lasers to be able to, I guess, recognize color variation. Colors. I wonder if that if that would ever be able to be performed on a ceratopsian skull, I, I, or I guess because they were covered in keratin, maybe since that decomposes, maybe there wouldn't be anything. But I, that'd be interesting to see if perhaps one day they could answer that question so that people like me don't make you guess <laughs> I, I, it would be a, a very interesting experiment if so, if someone could do that in, in some time. Right. So let's talk about some of the other dinosaurs. Can you can you cover some of the other species that have been found, uh, like in Coahuila or anywhere in Mexico? But you said it was a very narrow strip. So I guess you only have a, a small geographic area to look. What kind of things have been found from there? Well, uh, for example, in, in in what is now Baja California, uh, uh, William Morris and his team in the late '60s and the '70s, they found a lot of very interesting dinosaurs there. Uh, for example, um, a theropod they call the Labocania anomala, which uh, is the the which was until very very. Uh, mm, it, it was one of the the uh, very few uh, endemic species that were uh, named from Mexico. Right. And, and, and uh, Labacania was what was it? Sort of what appears to be the largest theropod that was living there that you know of. Well, in in Baja California, it, it was uh, it, it it is the one of the largest that they have found because um, there are not many um, postcranial or cranial material belonging to uh, theropods found in Mexico. What we uh, found more commonly are only uh, teeth. Right. So that that is the the, the problem that, that we have. Uh, for example, La Bocania, what uh, we think is that uh, it is a large tyrannosaur, but uh, the remains are badly weathered, and we don't have uh, many other things that uh, have been collected uh, since uh, uh, Ralph Molnar uh, described, it, described it in the 70s. Wow. So, you, wow. Wow. It, now that that could be that either the animal was very rare or 
it it may not have been the right conditions. Maybe it didn't prefer the areas where the conditions were right to be able to to become fossilized. But but certainly with with some of these larger herbivores you would expect there would be a predator there. Perhaps it just hasn't been discovered yet. Yeah. For example, in, in Coahuila, what we have found uh, are only um, big uh, tyrannosaur uh, teeth. Only that. Wow. Uh, some uh, uh, phalanx uh, bones, but uh, not very much on theropods. Boy, that's unfortunately quite, that's got to be frustrating because yeah the public seems to love the theropods and the bigger they are the more attention it gets and the more attention it gets then ideally you hope that the more funding could come in so that's <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's a little frustrating so yeah. so perhaps lavacania is is there or something similar to to a large tyrannosaur and then you have um obviously this uh, Coila ceratops, which is a ceratopsian. Has there been any other ceratopsians that were found there? Well, uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, naming a new uh, genus and, and a species of a ceratopsian, but the the formal paper has not come yet. Um, uh, it, it, it is uh, a different ceratopsian. And we, we were very lucky that uh, uh, National Geographic uh, was interested in this finding. And uh, the cover of the December, uh, uh, December of last year was uh, uh, on this particular discovery. But unfortunately, I, I cannot tell you very much about it because um, the formal paper has not come out yet. Sure. And, and we understand that. And, and that happens a lot. I, I would love to, and of course it puts you on the spot, but when the formal paper comes out, I'd love the opportunity to interview you again, where you are free to tell us a little more information. I saw the cover. As a matter of fact, congratulations to you. Um, Thank you very much. For, for being, for, uh, for those of you, uh, that, that December issue, um, highlights, uh, uh, Ruben and and the work they're doing and that new ceratopsian. So that's very exciting. So we've got ceratopsians. What about um, is it Velifrons? Is that the name of a of a a hadrosaur, right? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the 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 hadrosaurs are the most common uh, dinosaurs that we found in Mexico. Uh, um, paleontologist a colleague calls them the cows of the Cretaceous. <laughs> <laughs> because they are so, so the remains are so common. Uh, for example, uh, well, the, we have uh, some um, different species that uh, genus and species that have been named in the last few years. One of these is Belafrons coahuilensis, which was found in in the near the town of Rincon, Colorado, in the in southwest Coahuila. And it was named in 1997. So this uh, is characterized uh, because uh, it has a, a crest, uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, characteristic. And uh, uh, the name Bella France uh, seem, uh, uh, means that... Uh, its front was like, um, like the, mm, uh, the. Well, it, it has this this uh, crest, uh, which uh, they uh, they have found on also in in some other atrosaurs like uh, Corythosaurs, for example. Right. Uh, we we have one. We have the the replica skull. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yes, in our traveling museum. And when children see that this is a dinosaur from Mexico, especially it's funny when we are um, when we are anywhere down along the Texas Mexico border. Um, yeah. Oh my God! Little kids go crazy when they see this dinosaur. <laughs> 
because for them, it is, I had one little boy tell me once, he, he told me in Spanish, I, I speak Spanish, but only, not, not fluently, but enough to understand. And he looked at me and he said, is this my dinosaur? <laughs> and I said, because he was visiting from Mexico, I said, yes. And then he looked at me and his eyes got wide and he said, can I take it home? I went, no, no. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we misunderstand each other. <laughs> when he said oh, mine. This was fun. Oh, it was, it was great. So you've got, you've got duck bills. Um, now, do you find any evidence of, of other northern species like Edmontosaurus? Or are there any of the more common ones that are further north or do you still have your own distinct species uh, well the, the other genus uh, that has been uh, found and and uh, named from coahuila um, are uh, critosaurine a uh, hadrosaur which uh, was uh, named as latirrhinus latirrhinus uh, with Stlani, which uh, has been compared compared with the uh, Griposaurus or with a Critosaurus, but uh, um, uh, this this dinosaur also was found uh, very um, south in the Coahuila State, um, and uh, the the there there is a curious uh, thing about it that uh, it was collected. In the uh, early '90s, and its uh, um, skeleton was uh, on display for many years in some museums. The, they made casts, and they uh, they had it uh, in some museums. But uh, the genus and species was not recognized as new until very very uh, recently until uh, 2010 i guess oh wow so there's been a dinosaur that people thought was uh, was a, was a species that had already been found without realizing you have a very distinctively different animal do you know who was involved in recognizing that it was its own distinct species yes um the the people that that uh, the two colleagues that were involved in this was uh, uh, a Mexican uh, paleontologist, a female, uh, Claudia Serrano Brañas. I've heard of her. Yeah, and uh, um, Spanish paleontologist also, uh, which uh, um, I, I uh, well. The name escapes you. That's okay. Yeah. That's but, okay. Uh, you know, I will a, remember. <laughs> it, it's a shame that I can't send everybody questions so you at least have the opportunity to do do a reminder. <laughs> these, I feel terrible because I, I, it's easy for me just to ask these questions as the, as the interview goes. But for you, poor guys, you have to pull these things out of memory because you have no chance to prepare. <laughs> so you've got... Um, so, uh, so let me ask you now we, we, you've got, uh, what appears to be a big theropod. You've got, um, uh, uh, some hadrosaurs. Is there any evidence of some of the big saur, uh, big sauropods down there? Well, um, not in Coahuila, unfortunately, um, because in, in Coahuila we are in the companion age, but, uh, um, if we travel, uh, further north in the Chihuahua state, um, bordering the what is uh, in, in the United States, the um, uh, is it the Big Bend region? The Big Bend, yes, the Big Bend region sure. in Mexico is called the Altares region, and there uh, a number of uh, paleontologists have found. Uh, very huge bones, which uh, we we believe that they belong to the the huge uh, sauropod Alamosaurus. Right, right, because he's been found out in the Big Bend region, and there there was nothing separating that region from yours, right? So animals that are there, would it be very likely that they would also 
be there. You just maybe you don't have the same opportunities as far as the formations, but they would have traveled back and forth. There was nothing like a mountain range or anything like that that separated the two countries, right? No, it was the same conditions. Right. And the Alamosaurus is the the single or the only one genus of a serpa that is known from North America uh, in this uh, particular age. Right. And you know what's so funny is whenever I tell anybody here in Texas about Alamosaurus, they immediately assume that it's related or associated with the Alamo in San Antonio. <laughs> and yeah. I, I tell them that that fight took place many years after Alamosaurus died. <laughs> he was he was not the secret weapon to to <laughs> to win that war. Yeah. <laughs> so so the the and and let me ask you one one other thing. Uh, you studied. Uh, Edmontonia, but did you study it there, or did you just study it when you were up in Utah? Uh, no, uh, what we have studied in in uh, in the last in, uh, few years, um, they have been uh, here in Mexico when I uh, and uh, but we have uh, had the the. Um, well, many many um, paleontologists from the United States and Canada have helped us uh, to um, compare the material that we have with the, what they have found in, in the United States or in Canada. Uh, for example, some uh, colleagues have um, sent us uh, casts or very detailed information, pictures, uh, so we can compare them. So do you and to be sure that uh, uh, what we have is uh, really in Montonia. So, so does it look like it is, or again, is it a little bit different because of your environment there? Um, well, we believe that uh, the ge- it belongs to the genus in Montonia, but maybe the species could be different. Unfortunately, we don't have, uh, mm, we haven't found uh, additional material. And uh, what we have uh, is not uh, enough for us to to name a new species. Ah, got it. So unless more is found, right now you just have a mystery dinosaur that you at least think is from the the uh uh from genus edmontonia that's but right it could very well be a new species but until you find new new evidence yeah that, we cannot be sure until that got it so everybody loves raptors raptors seem to be so exciting to so many young people <laughs> do you do you find any evidence of of what we call raptors what you would refer to i guess as dromaeosaurs do do you have any evidence of those living there? Well, yes, uh, but um, uh, there have been uh, reported some uh, indeterminate dromaeosaurids um, from Coahuila, also from Baja California, too. Um, but uh, they are based only on on teeth again, and then some. Uh, pedal claws that they have found, but uh, n- not very much uh, of, a, uh, of a material that uh, we could uh, positively, positively um, recognize as uh, a new genus or a new species. Uh, for example, from Baja California, uh, they have reported Saurornitolestis langstoni, and uh, from Coahuila, also the genus, the same genus, Sauronitolestis. Oh, wow. And and uh, uh, they have uh, reported uh, Ricardo Stesia. Right. But based only on, on, on teeth, so not very much of, of a dromaeosaurid material here in Mexico until now. Right. So they were definitely there. 
you're just still trying to determine who they are or what, what yeah. species they are. That's right. Got it. So one of the things that I absolutely was so excited when I, when I read information about you was that you've had the opportunity to do some research with Dinosuchus that, yes. that duh, do I love that thing. Now, my first question is, is it actually a crocodile or is it an alligator or is it something in between? Well, um, I believe that it is uh, most closely related to alligators than to, croc- to true crocodiles based on their uh, morphological char- characters. And uh, uh, what we found uh, of uh, this uh, gigantic uh, alligator uh, where first uh, the big, big uh, uh, tooth, fragments of the of the jaw, and then some postcranial material also. You must have gone crazy when you got to see it for the first time. <laughs> yes. it, it is hard to get your mind around an alligator that is as large as that animal. Uh, just today, I just saw today on the news showing pictures of this big alligator in Florida, I think, where they filmed it just walking across walking across a road, I guess going from one body of water to the other. And and the I remember the newsman saying, you know, that thing is as big as a dinosaur. Well, that alligator was maybe, I suspect, maybe 18 feet long. But compared to Dinosuchus, that thing would no. be laughable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, um, what we have uh, also uh, found, and that is uh, interesting too, to talk about is uh, that uh, we have found some um, lung bones of some of uh, other source that uh, they have the bite marks uh, of Dinosuchus. Oh my gosh. How exciting is that? Not for the dinosaur, mind you, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that brings me then to the question that, that has truly bothered me from the day I learned about this, how on earth could that animal have hunted? Uh, and I say that because you look at modern alligators who lay by the, you know, lay submerged. You can't see they're there. And some unsuspecting animal walks up to get a drink and they come out of the water and grab him. But when you're as big as Dinosuchus, how, how do you hide <laughs> that mass? Do you have any idea how they did that? No. Not at all. Uh, It it is uh, a mystery. And uh, what we are not sure is uh, that uh, if they really hunt these uh, dinosaurs or if the dinosaurs were dead when Dinosuchus fed upon them. Right. So So he could be. That remains the question. Right. He he may have not killed anybody. He just took advantage of something that died naturally. Now, you know, um, I I wonder if dinosaurs, when you look at modern cows, some cows prefer to drink by the water's edge, but some wade wade, wade out up to their chest deep in water to drink. And I wonder if dinosaurs did that, then perhaps that allowed these big alligators to be able to hunt them and hide their mass because they're in much deeper water. Yeah. And boy, right. it is just such a mystery to think what this animal, because he's not designed for running, right? He doesn't have long legs. He's, no, he wouldn't no, be able to, to move that body very fast. But boy, I tell you, can you imagine a large carnivore killing an animal by the water's edge? And then that thing coming out of the water, you're out of luck. He's, he's just going to take your lunch and he's the ultimate bully. <laughs> yeah. <that's true. laughs> Uh, so I find I find him fascinating. We have a replica skull of Dinosuchus oh, really? in our museum. Yes, and again, <laughs> Must be huge. Oh, he's enormous, and children <laughs> just love him. But you know what's surprising is how many adults are immediately attracted to him because they walk up and look at him, and because they can understand. You know, kids sometimes can't comprehend when you're looking at the skull. It's not as easy to understand the size of the animal. But for adults who walk up, they just sit there and stare at it, and they'll turn around and ask me, "Is this, did this thing 
did this really live? And and my answer is, well, fortunately, a long time ago. <laughs> so you also, in, in your country, have some great Cenozoic uh, formations, right? You, you've got access to some of the Cenozoic things. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the, the more interesting Cenozoic animals that were living in Mexico? Uh, sure, uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, well, in Mexico, we have um, uh, the opportunity to, to work in uh, some tertiary and quaternary uh, localities. In the tertiary localities, um, what we have found are really uh, very, very uh, interesting. Like, uh, for example, the... Um, uh, a small uh, rhinoceros with a, a pair of horns in the tip of the nose uh, w- w- from the genus uh, Menoceros, which were also inhabitants of the Great Plains in the United States. But we have found them uh, all the way through here in, 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 in the uh, central part of Mexico. So this is kind of interesting. And... Uh, also, um, um, a dog was uh, that was uh, um, uh, adapted to a life very similar to the hyenas, uh, a hyena-like dog uh, called Vorophagus. I think that these two are the most interesting findings that uh, we have. Uh, collected here in in central mexico that that is where i have worked in the tertiary formations well we've got um that that borophagus we've got uh examples of him that have been found here in texas i know yeah and and he has got an incredibly what it seems to be incredibly powerful jaws and i think somebody said like you said they could have lived like hyenas being able to to crush bones crush the bones that's amazing that's right that's amazing. Now, I have a small uh, replica of a Borophagus that we use in our museum, and its teeth are worn com- completely flat. <laughs> yes. Flat. So I wonder if that's a representation of an older specimen, or because they are cracking bones, do they wear their teeth naturally flat regardless of their age? Well, I think that uh, it was... If they are flat, if if they uh, were flat, um, it was an old uh, individual. Ah. Because uh, I have seen, there are not uh, too many um, uh, material of this uh, particular dog, at least here in Mexico. But what I have seen uh, are this massive... A crushing uh, tooth and molars, uh, but they are not so flat. They they have uh, um, high crowns. Ah, so then then what I have is a very old, or perhaps a, a, a sick individual who is. But of course, it would take a long time to wear those teeth flat. Yes. That's so right. so that would have been an old specimen. Now something I read uh, about that species. Um, Somebody once thought that they were purely scavengers, but I read where someone said they are, they're so well distributed and they seem to be relatively common that they don't believe that it could be solely a scavenger because there wouldn't, there was too many of them. They have to be hunting. And you know, for the longest time, people thought hyenas were just scavengers. <laughs> yes. But boy, it's the same case. Yeah. yeah I, I wonder, do you think that's the same thing? Do you think, Yes, these animals were, were good at scavenging, but when they needed to, did they have all the necessary traits that would have made them a hunter as well? Yes, uh, surely. I think that they uh, they did uh, both uh, very well. Uh, hunting and scavenging, they were prepared to, to do both activities. Right. Now, there was a time in Earth's history where a lot of animals migrated from South America up into North America and North America into South America. Do you find some of the same mammals 
that they find in South America and North? Or like with the dinosaurs, do you find that a lot of yours are more are, are different enough to justify their own uh, their own species name? Um, well, the Great American Interbiotic Interchange uh, that took place uh, around 3.5 million years ago when the Panam- Panamanian uh, isthmus closed and uh, it, uh, it was possible to, to cross this, this uh, land. Mm, many of these uh, South American uh, animals uh, crossed Mexico and went far north into the United States and some of them into Canada. Uh, what we have uh, here in Mexico as well as in the United States are that uh, the genus and the species are similar, but they are not the same uh, of what they have described in South America. So they evolved in the way to uh, going north, and they are they, 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 the individuals that uh, were here in the late uh, uh, Pliocene and Pleistocene uh, are quite different uh, genuses and species than what they had in, in South America. Ah. Well, I read about you that you had the opportunity to study, if, I, if I'm correct, mammoth footprints? Yes. Oh my God, tell me about that. <laughs> And, and uh, well, first, let me tell you how how jealous I am of you. But please, don't let that bother you. <laughs> don't don't feel bad, Ruben. But, <laughs> but well, it, this this was a, a very uh, lucky find because um, there was a French uh, naturalist who lived in Mexico in the late eight hundreds who wrote a two or three pages a paper on a, a locality with the fossil footprints. But uh, it seems that nobody noticed and uh, nobody uh, had the, the opportunity to visit the, the locality to see if mm, the tracks were still there of if the locality was even still uh, there. So in 2006, uh, some colleagues and myself, mm, we tried to locate this uh, place and we were lucky enough to do it. So uh, we found the locality. uh, There we found uh, hundreds of uh, bird uh, uh, tracks. Uh, we have also the first um, smilodon-like uh, 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 tracks, and there is the the place where we found the, this uh, uh, big uh, uh, tracks that we attribute to a mammoth. Oh my gosh! So it wasn't just mammoth; it was others, and then it may. May have been. It was. It was certainly a cat-like track, and that. Yeah. Was it? Was it large or small? I mean, do do you have a? Re, do you, can you remember how big you think the animal might have been that left it? Do you do you remember that? Well, yes. Uh, from the um, the size of the front and the back paws of, of the of this uh, cat, it was really huge. Uh, that is the reason why we think that uh, it must be a smilodontine or a homeotorine. Wow. So a very huge cat. Uh, we are not uh, very, very uh, conclusively sure of what of these two different traits of big cats would be this track, the, the maker of these tracks, because... Uh, at first, we thought that they were uh, made by some big cat uh, similar to Smilodon. But uh, now that, that we have uh, 
uh, compare these tracks with others in some other parts of, of uh, the world, for example, with some that they have described in Spain, uh, we see that uh, there are uh, the, the Mexican tracks have the claws. Uh, they are visible, the claws. Oh. And the smilodontines, they retracted uh, their claws. Right. So what we think now is that uh, there must be a big cat, but from the other group, the homotery. So maybe that would be a homotherium or some big cat like that, the responsible to leave these tracks. Wow. So like modern cats, when when a when a big cat walks, its claws are retracted, so That's right. they don't leave any evidence. But your tracks have the evidence of the claws, so therefore yeah. it's more likely. Now, did the homotheriums did they did they have non retractable claws? Do you know? That's correct. Ah, I didn't know that. So then, yeah. <laughs> it, but but because of the size, it it would be at least the homotheriums that I'm aware of are not are nowhere near as big. I don't know if they got as big, but they don't seem as big as Smilodon. But these tracks that you looked at would make it a very large member of that family. That may be larger than what I'm thinking. Huh? Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, mm. I they believe that uh, maybe not in North America, but in Europe, they have found some homoterines, very very huge, uh, maybe the same size as the smilodon. Wow! Boy, you learn something new every day. See, this is why I'm glad I get the chance to do this, because I don't know of any place that the average person would ever have the opportunity to get that information. And, and so what we're talking about for, for those of you who may not be familiar with some of these terms, I, I certainly want you to look them up. Um, it's, there's different species of cats and the one group seems to be a shorter bodied, more robust version. And then you have the big cats like Smilodon, which everybody knows is they all call it the saber tooth tiger. And that's not the appropriate name for it. But so now what it sounds like is based on your track at least there was one that could very well be rival the size of Smilodon, yet be from that different group of of cats. That's correct. That's exciting. And was it only one set of tracks? Was it one track? What What was it like? No, no. There, there was uh, some some tracks. Um, unfortunately, this uh, quarry has been worked for a hundred or more years, oh. uh, supplying. This rock, this uh, they cut the slabs of rock and they use it in, in construction works. Right. Right. So unfortunately, we have lost oh. many and many of, of these evidences. And uh, uh, the quarry workers told me, for example, that uh, a few years ago, they found uh, uh, some tracks, also like this cat uh, tracks, but uh, they uh, they told me that there was a set of tracks, uh, uh, big tracks, and then small tracks oh my beside God. this. Can you imagine if you would have been able to see that? Oh, that's, yes, that's frustrating. That would be awesome. Oh, yeah, and that unfortunately they're lost. Uh, I understand that, and that brings up my last point. One of the things that is so frustrating. Well, there's two things that are frustrating. One that you understand that the, the individuals who own the land have to make money to survive. And I understand that. And, and it's a business. But it's so frustrating that when they come across those kind of things, even if they could just throw them in a pile and just call you and say, hey, come see what this is and just that. The other thing that's happening here a lot, and I don't know if you have the same problem uh, there in Mexico, but that is, of course, the illegal trade of sneaking onto private land or government land and stealing fossils for the sake of stealing them or selling them. Do you have to deal with that as well in Mexico? Yes, George. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, there is a very important black market of fossils uh, going on their way here in Mexico from some years uh, until now. And uh, the difference uh, is that here in Mexico, we don't have uh, private lands that owns their own fossils. 
all the, the paleontological heritage is um, part of the country's heritage. Oh, so if they're stealing fossils, they're stealing from the country. Yes. And uh, there is an institute, which is the uh, National Institute of Anthropology and History, that uh, has the legal uh, part of this uh, um, laws uh, protecting the, the paleontological heritage of Mexico. But unfortunately, uh, uh, what happens every day in many parts of Mexico is that uh, many people is uh, collecting and is selling this uh, uh, part of the of the heritage of, of, of this country. Oh God, that makes me sick. That makes me absolutely sick. And you know, if there's money to be made, somebody is going to ignore what they're doing to make it. They don't care. And and it's possible that absolute direct evidence of a tyrannosaur could have been picked up by somebody and sold to someone and now it's sitting in somebody's office and they don't realize that they've stolen history from your entire country and its citizens and that's very frustrating there are many um, uh, collect fossil collectors that are very conscious sure uh, and that they let us uh, know when they have a new specimen or when they collect something that might be important. And that is the the way that uh, we have, for example, Coahuila Ceratops. Coahuila Ceratops was collected in 1990, 1992, or something like that. But it was not until 2006 that the the uh, fossils could be studied and the paper went out and the fossils were donated to a museum's collection. Right. So there are uh, very uh, conscious uh, fossil collectors, but unfortunately there are also people who uh, who see this as a business only. Right. And, and you're right. And the same thing uh, goes here in the U.S. We have a lot of professional fossil collectors who work very closely with the science community. They share the information and it's run as a business. So it's not all bad, but it is those who have no concern for the science that scare me because they are, they're not sharing any information. And, and if they find a skeleton, all they want is the head and the teeth and the claws yes. and, and that's it. So they destroy the other pieces getting to it. Well, that's, that's very frustrating, but you know, hopefully with more education, uh, we can teach people that there's so much better. It's so much better to share these and share them with museums. And so speaking of museums, I'd like to wrap up the interview with the question. What are some of the museums that you have in, in different parts of Mexico that you could recommend for people to come visit? Sure. You're sure. Well, uh, one of the best natural history museums where you can uh, see uh, a very interesting uh, dinosaur and uh, marine mammal, marine and reptiles and fossil mammals collections is the Museo del Desierto, the Desert Museum, which is in the, uh, Saltillo, the capital of, uh, of, the, of the state of Coahuila. That is a very, very interesting museum. It was inaugurated in uh, in the year 2000, I guess. And also in some other parts of the country, in the Jalisco state, uh, maybe you have heard about the city of Guadalajara. Of course. Guadalajara is the, the capital of Jalisco, uh, which is in the, the western portion of, of, of Mexico, is the second city in importance here in Mexico. And they have uh, two very interesting museums, the, muse the El Museo de Paleontología, or the Museum of Paleontology, there in Guadalajara, which uh, is based on the collections of one uh, paleontologist uh, who uh, worked for some 60 
or some years uh, collecting fossils from the region of Jalisco, and uh, they made it uh, the museum. And the regional uh, anthropology and history museum in Guadalajara, which is also very interesting to see, uh, in um, in Mexico City, well, they have the uh, Museo de Geología, the Museum of Geology, which is uh, uh, housed in a in an extraordinary building, which was uh, built up uh, on purpose to house a geological and paleontological collections. It has a, a very nice uh, bas reliefs of pterosaurs, uh, ichthyosaurs, uh, mm, ammonites on the on the frontispiece of this of this building, and also the the natural uh, history museum in Mexico City, where they have the cast of uh, the Diplodocus that uh, uh, was a gift of Andrew Carnegie, and and in Puebla State, also in the Valley of Mexico, in Puebla State, uh, there is a very new museum. They inaugurated uh, it uh, last year, which which is called the Evolution Museum, which is a very large museum and very interesting also. And well, the last but not least is the mm, Museum of Paleontology in Tuxtla Gutierrez in Chiapas state. Chiapas is the state where they have these uh, mines where they are mining the amber, uh, where they have uh, collected a very, very special uh, uh, examples of this, of this uh, fossil resin. And they have many of these in, this, in its collections of this uh, paleontological museum. Man. Well, if you are in or around or traveling to Mexico, those museums would be places you want to go. And they cover the whole country. So no matter what part of the country you're in, you would have the opportunity to go to at least one of them. Um, I, I, I am so thrilled to hear of all of the things that are happening there in Mexico and especially of your work. And, and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate, how much I appreciate you taking time out uh, after a hard day's work to still take the time to answer my questions. Thank you very much, George. He is, I, I really appreciate it. You bet. He is the director of vertebrate paleontology at the Center for the Conservation of the Natural and Cultural Heritage of Mexico, paleontologist Ruben Guzman Gutierrez. Thank you again for taking time. And we would really like the chance to interview you again when you finally announce that new Ceratopsian. Sure. Thank you very much, George. You bet. Okay, you guys, let's do a couple of quick Ask Dinosaur George uh, questions. I'll try to answer some of them. Let's go with Quentin, who lives in Sha Tin, which is in Hong Kong, I do believe. Uh, Quentin's question was, why do predators want to eat iguanodon, and would it use its spikes? Well, iguanodon, obviously as an herbivore, is a target for any carnivore. Uh, be, because of the food. Now, carnivores have to sort of decide, if that's the right answer, whether or not they're willing to risk attacking something that is either bigger than themselves or better protected. So if an animal was going to attack an iguanodon, it would attack, obviously, because of the food source wanting to eat it. But I think the dinosaurs would at least be semi-cautious about attacking something that had a couple of big thumb spikes that could be very efficient weapons. So that, that would be my best guess. All right, Travis from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Hey, DG, Travis again, and I have a question for you. Do you think in times of severe drought, different species of dromaeosaurids like Deinonychus and Velociraptor would team up to take down large prey? Thank you for reading and answering my questions. Have a great day. Thank you, Travis. Very kind of you, buddy. Um, Cooperative hunting among carnivores is a rarity. And quite frankly, the only ones I can think of where they hunt cooperatively occurs in the ocean between dolphins and birds. 
I, and birds really, they're not really cooperating that much. They're, I guess really they're taking more of an advantage of it. So I, I guess I stand corrected. I cannot think of two carnivores, regardless of the environmental situation that are alive today, who work together in an effort to bring down larger prey. I, I just don't know if they would do that or not, Travis. You know, my guess would be no. I don't believe two different species of carnivores would work in unison to bring down prey because then the question becomes, I helped you kill it, but you're not going to let me eat it because that's exactly what would occur. The biggest or the ones that outnumber the other are going to take over. I think what would be more likely during a time of drought is you would see that some dinosaurs would take on a greater role of being scavenger and trying to pick up anything they could find along the way so they might follow larger carnivores you know you may find dromaeosaurs following larger carnivores not to try to steal anything but to be able to get at the scraps so that's an interesting question and and i wish i had a better answer for you but that's the best i have all right kim from hanover colorado my family and i are avid fossil hunters that started a few years ago that's cool i was wondering what is a good book uh for fossil hunting we have a family of four. We live in Colorado, but a book in general would help. Well, thank you, Kim. Thank you for taking the time to write. I'm so happy to hear that you and your family are spending quality time outdoors. And what could be more fun than fossil hunting? You know, when I first started fossil hunting, there was a series of books, and I believe they are called The Rock Hound Guide. And there was one, I think, for every state, The Rock Hound Guide for Texas. The Rock Hound Guide for Colorado. The Rock Hound Guide for, I think it was Rock Hound or Roadside Guide. Maybe that's what it was called. Roadside Guide to Texas Geology. Roadside Guide to Texas or to Colorado Geology. That might be the accurate title, Kim. That might be the accurate title. But whatever the case, just Googling either one of those. It's one of those, I can tell you. You can find one that is state specific and these books actually give you locations where the public can go. Now, keep in mind, of course, anybody that reads that book knows of the location. So sometimes it's been picked over, you know, because other people have been there. But I'll tell you something that would work. There are geological survey maps geological survey maps that are made at least they know they're made here in texas and they kind of separate the state into areas and they do a geological map and the map shows you what time period is exposed in different parts of the state and it makes a notation of what sort of fossils can be found there when i was fossil hunting i didn't want to go to the same spot where everybody else on the planet went so what I did is I would buy one of those geological maps. I would study it. I would look on the map for a place that looked like it was good. Like, for instance, a big outcropping of, of whatever you're hunting for. Let's say you want to find a uh, prehistoric sea life. Well, you look for a time period when your state was mostly under the ocean. And then you pinpoint some of the areas. And then you just drive. You drive and you look for road cuts along the way. You look for exposures along the way. Now, let me say for the record, it is not okay to simply go onto other people's property. We can't crawl over fences. This is for everybody, Kim. I know with you and your family, you would recognize that. But I'm just saying for everybody, you can't go onto state land. You can't go onto federal land. You can't go onto private property. But there are road cuts along the roads where in most cases, uh, they're, they're happy to let people pick up things. Uh, I see people doing it all over the all over the country. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But you may also want to check with your individual state. But see if you can find a geological survey map and see if that might help you. Or look up one of those two books, A Roadside Guide to Geology or A Rockhound Guide to Geology also is another title. Look those up and I'm quite sure that you'll be able to find something that I bet you and your family will absolutely love. And if you ever find some new amazing discovery i hope that uh i hope that you let me know about it so that i can spread the word to everybody out there all right you guys listen i hope you enjoyed this podcast i've really enjoyed uh speaking to uh mr gutierrez 
who was very knowledgeable about all the things that are found in Mexico. I hope you do a little bit of research on your own, uh, your own on Coheloceratops. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You'll see links on my podcast page, which is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com. Please visit my website. Click on the catalog. If there's something on there you like, I hope you'll consider buying it because those kind of sales help me focus more time on doing these podcasts. And finally, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. You can see my calendar, where I'm speaking, where I'm appearing, and maybe there may be a chance that I'll get to meet you. Until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. Be kind to everyone because being mean and hateful to people who disagree with you does not serve any purpose and it doesn't make anything better. It makes it worse. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 